truth. No chaser. Welcome to Truth No Chaser. I'm Ashley. And I'm Jay. And I'm Frank. And this is the podcast for black people by black people about everything black. This is our flagship production. It is a shot of truth stirred with bold opinions. Reversing the miseducation of the black community as it relates to culture, health, and politics. And this evening we have Miss Lanita C. Brenson. I'm sorry, joining us, guys. Welcome her to the show. Welcome, yes. welcome, hey, yes, welcome. <laughs> Let's get into this bio. Mm -hmm. Author of "You Have the Power and You Survive Now What" journals is finishing up her next book about surviving relationships and the lessons they teach you. She has a social media presence where she lives authentically, good, bad, and ugly. The intention is to help people, women especially, that regardless to what life brings, we can survive in it, then learn to thrive in it. Again, let's welcome Miss Lanita. Yes, yes, yes. Hi. How are you awesome. doing, Miss Lanita? I'm yes, so yeah. fabulous. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you, thank you for gracing us with your presence. Yes. All right. You're talking yes. about salt. So what you say? Uh, social media presence is very small. She had 19,000 something followers. I know that you took the I small took, I took out. That's why I said we're not going to put this. We're not going to minimize this small right. in this. In this no, no, man. We're not doing thank, that. Look, thank you for that. letting us right. on your show. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Talking about small. small. This is the Lanita <laughs> show. <laughs> yeah, and show. And we, and and we, we're the guests. And we, and we are Truth No Chase. <laughs> Featuring. Right. <laughs> Truth No Chase. Yes. So I met Miss Lanita um, last year at a retreat. Phenomenal woman. Right. Um, and she shared some of her stories with us. And I thought about different topics we we're talking about this year. And one of them was abuse came up emotional and verbal abuse. Okay. So although she's very fabulous and you know we love looking at her mm -hmm. we wanted to talk about that so do you mind sharing with us in the audience things you've experienced some of the different types of abuse you've experienced mm -hmm. sure um it's not a I, I since i got the text from you i really have yes. been sort of pondering and thinking about do i really want to sort of make these words come out of my mouth it's not a topic that is very common in our household right. in terms of parents and grandparents and those types of things so um, I've written about it recently, but actually speaking, it made me very nervous, mm. but nothing happens necessarily by accident. So I said, okay, well here may as well get it out. Right. Um, my mother is very open about her story. Uh, my mother was a product of abuse um, in her household. My grandfather was abusive to her. Ironically enough, as he, as he became older, she ended up taking care of him. And then my mother, um, beyond the relationship with her father, um, was married a couple times and and they were abusive as well so I have a, a short memory of remembering that's not what I want right mm -hmm. so I, with great intention I was like I won't be choosing these kind of men I won't and I never blamed my mother right I always blamed him um, but I knew what I didn't want I just have never seen my mother in what is considered a successful relationship mm -hmm. so I just knew what I didn't want so I was steered sort of towards that direction. It's so ironic how things work. I've ended up in probably two or three relationships that were abusive. And when you hear the word abusive, you think physical. Right. You think somebody's punching mm -hmm. you in the face, knocking you on. Honestly, not my story at all. While I've never been physically hit, the emotional and psychological trauma of being attached to a person who is dealing with their own demons mm -hmm. is traumatizing. Mm -hmm. As much as wearing a physical scar, there's an emotional scar as much as sometimes you want to forget it exists, Right, can be triggered in different situations, different conversations, different types of things. Um, probably one of the, one of the ones that are, it's not relatively recent, but the last one, and I swore that it would never happen again. And it's been probably 10 years now. So I like to think that I'm beyond that line of thinking. Um, it was a, a guy that I met that was that I had known him for probably about two or three years. Mm -hmm. He was extremely persistent with asking me out. I run into him here, run into him there, and he would. And I just my answer was always no. My first instinct was always no, but thank you. You know, you have to be graceful with the rejection because it can trigger mm -hmm. other people. So that's, that's a, a that's whole. A, other that's other that's a, yes. Unfortunately, that's yeah. a it's real a thing. Whole other that's topic. that. Yeah. yeah. So. I finally gave in after about three years and let him take me to dinner. Mm -hmm. And that just turned into a kind of relationship. Then I started letting him come over. He already knew my son. I, my son now was 23, but at that time my son was maybe eight, nine, somewhere in there. And um, he knew my son because of how we would run into each other 
as a single mom, your child is sometimes attached at your hip. If you saw me, you saw him, that kind of situation. So I finally let the guy take me out, turned into a relationship, and he he got me with the story of his children. Mm. Um, he was fighting for his children with his um, ex-wife um, and exes in quotes because she actually, of course, I found out much later it was not actually his ex, but that's a whole oh. other show as well. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. It's pretty multifaceted. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So we got into this sort of this relationship and it was going pretty decently. You know, we moved in together. Big mistake. We combined finances. Big girl mistakes. Then his children would come on weekends, but he would be away working on weekends. So, so I became. You had them. They be, yes. Mm-hmm. Set up. Can you say set up? Because that was a setup for me. Because all I knew was children want to be with their father. He's fighting for custody. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the story that he told, my heart went out to, well, let me save these children. I always wanted to save somebody, child. That's also a whole other show. I missed a lot of shows wrapped up in this one story. <laughs> He's played on your harp strings. Oh, my gosh. We, we got part twos and threes. Right, and right. Already lined up. up. The emotional strings were um, very easy for me because my first instinct for people is to help. Mm-hmm. Even at the detriment of my own situation, but it's always such an afterthought that I jump first, and I'm like, "Okay, I shouldn't have volunteered for that. Yeah, should have said no." But I was so far into it um, until it just and abuse is not something that's blatant a lot of times. Right. It's not like somebody's knocking you around the, on your first date. Mm-hmm. Is we're talking a year into the relationship where I was like, "Okay, something is off," mm-hmm. and I should have remembered. I said no initially, just instinctively. It was then telling me this is not a situation you need to be in. Dealing with his own demons, there was a situation with his son, and his son and my son were the same age. Mm -hmm. Um, So their interaction was always very strained until one day we were on some sort of family trip, and I saw him really sort of flip off on his son. And it was public, and it was bad. I was scared, and it wasn't even me. Right. And I was like, okay, so this is in him This is a problem. So in my mind, I go back to what I saw my mother experience. Mm -hmm. And I said, "Um, there's a problem. It's going to be a problem. Um, I felt stuck at that point because for me as a single mom, there was always a financial situation. Right. So he became sort of the hero. He would come and make sure that I was good, make sure my son was good, sign him up for this, showing up at the practices. So he became all that I said I needed Mm -hmm. because I said I needed. So he morphed into that. To being that person. Mm -hmm. But one thing about that, if that's not who you are authentically, you are not going to be able to maintain that facade forever. Mm -hmm. Year, year and a half into it, of course, start the layers start to peel away and I start seeing different little things and it's like okay how do I get out of this but I was also dealing with my sister who um was had been diagnosed with cancer she was passing away so I was helping take care of her Mm. which became issues because I also helped take care of my brother who had passed away 10 years before that so literally I'm dealing with a lot of things at once I just needed home to be a place where my son was right you know I love this guy but I don't think I was ever in love with him I just wanted to some sort of security, even if it was a made up one. Yeah. Right. Which it, it ended it up being sort of that situation. The head really came when we had started taking marriage counseling at our church. Ooh. Something I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure, you know, maybe I can grow to be what people consider to be in love. You know, right. I can't live without you. I figured, I thought that's what that was supposed to look like and feel like and intense. And I just never had that. I'm like, okay, well, maybe marriage counsel will bring that out. Right. And I'm looking at the couples in a marriage counseling class and I'm like, we, it don't look like, <laughs> you know, all the exercises, I found them very difficult to do in class. Yeah. Mm. Say this to your maid, yeah. look, turn to your mate face to face and do these exercises. They were very difficult to the point where I had to use the bathroom a lot during this class. Mm-hmm. I just need to be excused one second. It's like, <laughs> but I'm not looking at him like she's looking at him or he's yeah. looking at her. I said something was wrong. Mm-hmm. So I went to talk to the, the leaders of the class after class and explain sort of my dilemma. So they decided, well, let's do marriage counseling separate. Let's do it away from the class because clearly there's some issues. Mm-hmm. Let's just resolve what they are. But let me back up first. How did we get engaged? Because I skipped that whole situation. Yeah, I thought y'all were going to counsel just because. Because no, I we attended, I was engaged. Because I got a ring. <laughs> and I figured that's what I was supposed to do. Well, we were. the relationship was really, really not good. But he would travel for work. So that was always my break. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, I have his kids. The kids are good. It's not their fault. 
but I had a break from him. But I was a parent now from one to three, and it was more than I had generally. But you figure you when you marry somebody, you marry all of the kids and everything. You know, yeah. so I was that mom. I was that bonus mom. You know, that's when that title was becoming kind of really popular. It's like, okay, bonus mom. I got some bonus kids. <laughs> yeah, not that fun. <laughs> So we're strange, relationship strange. We're arguing before he went out of town on one of his uh, weekend trips for work. And I was had decided while he was gone, I can't do this. Right. I cannot do this. He comes back from the trip early and I didn't know it. I'm in the bed sleep and I look up and he's standing over me, but he's standing over me with my son. Oh, we didn't have his kids that weekend with my son. He said, I need you to come into the living room. I'm like, what is it? I'm looking at my child and he's. I can see this sort of glee on his oh, face. He's, ha- okay. mm-hmm. he's happy, mm-hmm. but I'm wondering why is he home and why is he waking me up? Well, he proposed that night. But remember, I had already decided in my head, I was done. Right. I needed to end this, it, but I, he, I think he must have felt it. He would have been crazy had he not. I don't know where the ring came from, but he incorporated my son into this proposal. The pulling your heart and my again. son was behind his head going, say yes, say yes. And I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I said yes, and the very first thing I said was, how am I going to get out of this to myself? You know, you're supposed to be happy, and mm-hmm. you're posting the picture, and I was posting nothing. But I was just like, okay, this is not... So following this, I'm, I'm really just going through the motions, just trying to figure out how how was I going to get out of this. Started the counseling. Fast forward, they were counseling us one-on-one, and even in telling the story, and this is this is the only place I felt like I could really be honest Mm -hmm. lay it all out I told everything Mm -hmm. things weren't really going well what I didn't say was it because we had co-mingled finances all of the money was going to one account although I did keep a sidebar one just in case Mm -hmm. it was it was small it wasn't enough that I could do anything with but you know I could eat if I needed to well this man wasn't paying the rent I came home one day and there was eviction notice on our door oh I was livid like to the point of it's a crazy lady outside walking down but down the street do we call the police oh because I was that was that that angry right there was no explanation he was sorry he needed to fix his truck blah 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 blah. it was always it was something but this was also entangled in the counseling separately I got a ring on we had to move suddenly we running from the rent man and it's just like this is not this is just not the life I envisioned even as a single mom I wasn't right. doing this bad right so doing the counseling I, that was the only place I felt safe so that's when I told everything even though he was next to me I was a little nervous that's when everything came out mm-hmm. it's not working I don't know if it's and they flat out said we counsel people all the time and we tell people spiritually whether we think they're yoked or not this is not a good situation Mm -hmm. and this is I'm just going to advise you and you can do what you want that you all not get married this is not working I felt like I had won the lottery I said okay it's not just me I am this is a situation that I can that I'm sort of stuck in so they counseled us again going a couple additional sessions and one of the things they had him agree to was leave her in the shape that you found her she's living by herself she and her son get her set up Y'all work on your shel- yourselves individually and maybe it will come back together. He agreed in the office. <laughs> we got to the parking lot and he said, I'm damn. And that's when it started. I was like, okay, what are we going to do? So because we were still living together, it became very difficult. There were additional bedrooms when his kids weren't there on weekends that I slept in and he slept in the other room. Well, that was an issue. He would come lay in the bed with me and I would just, I would get up and move to the other room. So that's when the uh, the emotional and psychological sort of abuse started. Man, oh man. Yeah. So I would try to get up and go to the bathroom and look up and he's standing in the doorway and I'm like, oh gosh. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. So that's yeah. when those little stuff, he'd come home early from work or I'm thinking he's going to work or he wouldn't go to work. I get up to go to work and he's saying that he's fixed me breakfast and he's, won't we sit down, honey? And I'm like, what is happening? So if those psychological things, I felt like I was crazy. Right. I didn't have enough money to move anywhere. I was really trying to keep a lot of that from my son yeah. because he adored this man, which made it even more difficult. It's like, and it was the only person because his father was not present. It was the only man I had ever seen my son adore mm-hmm. he, he, that somebody was present for that. My son would hug and that, that did something to me again, right. the heartstrings. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, how do I keep this from my son, but still be able to, I can't do this. You know, I could get married and go with the motions. And now my son, he was pick, helping me look at through dresses. And I'm like, 
it just became a very difficult situation yeah. to get out of to one day I just couldn't do it anymore the final straw in addition to him standing in doorways and not letting me out of the house if I have to be to work at a certain time and I've got all my things he's at the front door let's talk let's save this relationship I got home one day from work nobody was there this was one weekend his kids weren't there my son wasn't there they had gone somewhere he comes home and the kids are like oh my god we got a surprise for you you're gonna be so happy he sends the kids to their room and he comes in a room with me and closes the door and locks it so I'm prepared like okay what is happening he had bought a necklace I remember this so clearly because I was terrified I saw the jewelry come out of his the jewelry box come out of his pocket and I'm like Whatever you have, please just get your money back. I'm not accepting any gifts from you. The rings on the dresser, we're not moving forward. What are you doing? The kids help me pick it out. They want to wait and see you in it. You have to put it on. And I just, ref I kept refusing it. So he would stood in front of me. I'm sitting on the bed, just really trying to figure out almost an escape plan of such. Mm -hmm. The door is locked. The kids are across the hall. How in the hell do I not raise hell in this room? to not disturb the kids but still not be subjected to whatever he's planning because he's been planning this all day he has a picture of what he thinks this is going to turn out like and I'm right. I, whatever character you need I'm not her so I kept saying no kept saying no he takes it out of the box he shows it to me in his hand and he actually unlocks it so he's walking towards me wanting to put this on my neck and I'm literally like some sort of a character in a cartoon I'm from the bed to the bathroom to the side of the, where the window is. I'm literally almost running from him, but in silence, wanting to scream, but can't because he is determined to give you this necklace, to give me the necklace. So I'm yeah. ter I'm terrified to finally, when he's on one side of the room, I run out of room and I just go sit in there with the kids, but he's waiting. He's literally in the room, just sort of rocking back and forth. I call my mother and I was devastated to call her because I didn't want to incorporate that into her. We had recently lost my sister 10 years before we, and I didn't want to scare my mother. She had already right. been through enough, but I didn't know what else to do. I knew if I called the police, that was a whole other situation. You got a black man and a black woman and a bunch of kids that were, I just didn't want that. So I called my mother, I was in tears and she said, let me talk to him. But that infuriated him even more. You actually call your mother, blah, blah, blah. That's the night I actually left. I got mm. my son and I threw some, I, but prior to that, I had enough intuition to, to pack a bag for my son and pack a bag for me. I said, if ever I come to you in the middle of the night and say, let's go, don't question me, just get in the car. Well, this was that night. His kids were crying. He was crying. Nobody understood what was happening. So I didn't come back at all until he wasn't there. He went to work the next day. I came and got some clothes that weekend. He won a golf trip. I got some of my friends that I sing with. I said, please don't ask me any questions. I need help. I ran a U-Haul. Within one day, the weekend he was gone, I moved everything out. And I never looked back. He oh, would wow. see me at church. He would see me in different places. I just, I left the ring on the dresser. I get to church one Sunday. He's coming towards me with the ring. I was like, you must be on drugs. We are in our church. Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. But I never looked back. I never, I finally had to explain to the kids I didn't explain to my son, honestly, and he's 23, probably three years ago, exactly what happened. Because I just, he couldn't handle, I just didn't want him to have to deal with that. But it, I didn't know what was worse, telling him or not telling him. But we lived in, a friend of mine helped me live in a hotel. We lived in a hotel park for about six months before I could save. I had a decent job, but when you're trying to pay that and eat and gas and all of those things, right. it was just a, a that lot. was... It was a lot. It was a lot. And then have to look at my son's face and he's wondering, why are we still staying at a hotel? You know, but at that point, it was fun for him. But after a while, it's like, so, I mean, where do we live? Like, do yeah. we live someplace? But I had a Ooh. friend of mine that I worked with that was a blessing. It was uh, one of my colleagues. He would pay for us for like two or three weeks at a time. And then when I could pay, I would. So, But I, I never looked back. I gave the ring back. And we were probably six weeks away from a date that we had set. I couldn't do it. Yeah. The closer we got, the more afraid I became. And I feel like in my heart of hearts that had I gone through with it, he would have put his hands on me. Mm -hmm. Because from a sexual standpoint, he would if I would refuse him sexually, he would lay his body. And he was an ex-Marine, would lay his body on top of me. Mm -hmm. Like literally just lay there and let his body weight sink in until I gave in. Mm -hmm. Terrifying. So it's not just physical. You would, I would still get up the next day. I'll be singing at church and at work and nobody will ever know. I was going home to just this, this subtle chaos that I just didn't know 
how to handle until I realized, okay, I need to talk about it. So and I had gotten a counselor at that time. I made sure that I wanted to heal from whatever that pattern was of attaching myself to people who were just not available or authentic to what I needed. That that's how I learned how to really stand and say, no, I'm not interested and stick with that. Yeah. And, you know, not be worn down to say, okay, well, he keeps asking. Clearly, he must be a good guy. No. <laughs> that psychological abuse is a beast so, and it's not one over the other it just it's just all bad so what do you in, in that case like that that's more than delusional yeah that's that's like uh controlling um and what w- what would you or, or would you call that like let me let me let me, let me not diagnose myself like would, would you call that delusion or would you call that just controlling i'm sorry that's what I, I think it's both you. i think it's both I had a conversation with his mother much after that older lady. They live in the country. She's got a big farm. Mm-hmm. And she said, baby, I should have I should have warned you. His father is the same way. Mm. And I didn't know how to handle it then. And I didn't really know how to tell you. She said, I just hate to hear that he's like that. Mm-hmm. But I, I know exactly what you're dealing with. And I just wish she had cared enough about herself. And then cared enough about anybody else related dealing with her sons because there were three of them. Right. And I'm not saying that they all were like that, but to to um, to for her to automatically identify to what I had even finished telling her, mm-hmm. it broke my heart because yeah. she could have saved me some trouble, and maybe nobody saved her of the trouble. It's so generational sometimes. Mm-hmm. It is delusional. The delusion is I'm this good guy. I've got a good job. I'm taking care of my kids. Why don't you want me? Mm-hmm. But I was sort of a prize to him. I was the one that kind of, you know, the the step up kind of thing. So he was like, everybody seen me with her. I'm not losing her. He even said that one time. But people know we engage. I'm like, and what? Right. So for him, it was a losing thing. Like, I can't lose you. And he just lost it. But I feel mm-hmm. like that's who he was the whole time. But he just sort of morphed mm-hmm. into my idea of, of what, what I said I needed. Okay. Because because this generation here, we have a new saying, right? It's called red flags, right? Ooh. So you, um, you know, his his pursuit of you mm-hmm. was all telling of everything that you went through throughout your your entire, you know, relationship. And not to offend you, let me just okay. just just just. No, not at all. Is, is, did you place any blame on yourself? Like, oh, lots. Of, okay, most of it. Mm-hmm. Most of it. I am very. Um, self-aware mm-hmm. so I knew that I had made a mistake okay. I, my first mistake was saying yes mm-hmm. my additional one was being able to take any money from him additionally mm-hmm. introducing him to my son in that capacity because he already knew him right. but introducing him on a personal level was something very different gotcha. so yeah, oh absolutely I'm never a one person it's all your kind of fault I, I definitely looked and realized that some things I should never ever have done at what point maybe in the situation had you started rationalizing that it was okay yeah when even if it was really early it was early it's actually that's a very good question and i can almost pinpoint it when i had a georgia power bill due that mm-hmm. i could not pay and he paid it mm-hmm. for me as a single mom mm-hmm. that felt like okay he gets it mm-hmm. he sees the area where i'm struggling mm-hmm. he plugged right in no questions but it was, asked. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. no questions, not asking for anything mm-hmm. in return at the time. But in my mind, looking back, there was this sort of not even a master plan of such, because I don't know that you can plan that. But there are certain things that lead to certain other things. Mm-hmm. I became indebted to an attachment to him mm-hmm. because he plugged in where there was a deficit for me. Mm-hmm. Right. With my son showing up to practices, paying for his baseball uniform, yeah. um, maybe picking him up from school for me when I was stuck at work. Those kinds of things for me were something that I had never had, but desperately wanted as a single mom. Mm-hmm. So he plugged right in and immediately I accepted it because I, it gave me a chance to breathe. Yeah. Yeah. He started checking all the. This is what a real man is. Boxes. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know all Absolutely. the. Oh, you never had this before. Right. right Even right, right, if right. it wasn't verbally spoken, it was an intention mentally to where he just plugged right in. Right, so even gotcha. then, there wasn't as much communication as it is now between people or between me and him or even with me because I, who I am now is not who I was then. Um, mm-hmm. I've always been outspoken, but I've been. It's been very difficult for me to be outspoken to, as an advocate for myself. 
that I, I could advocate for a bunch of other people. Yeah. Because that's kind of my thing. I'm comfortable there. But for myself, I'm a little more reserved. And that's where I've gotten in trouble with attachments yeah. to dudes who really just, you know, are not overall just not good people. Why do you think so? I've had this conversation with my mother before. My, as my mother's getting older, I've become kind of a caretaker for her in certain ways. I help her with certain bills and those kinds of things. It was really because my mother was a teenage mom and she was 16 when she had me. And my sister who passed away was a year and a half behind me. So I became a mom before I became a kid. Mm -hmm. So I was always taking care of somebody. Mm -hmm. So that's where I was comfortable. I knew how to do it. It was easy. It's kind of routine. There was not a, because I was the firstborn, um, I think somebody mentioned it. I was reading something was, you know, oldest daughter syndrome to a degree. Everything's a syndrome, but it, some of the characteristics make sense. My first instinct is to care for as opposed to taking care of myself. So it's just instinctive for me to plug in over there than it is over here. Because if I plug in and all that I might need, I might find that I need a lot and that might hurt me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I've had to do that in order to heal. And that's a, that takes time. Mm-hmm. So though you may not be an expert, why do you think it's hard for women to leave? Not women only, because obviously men are abused as well, too, and not domestic, but verbal as well. Why do you think it's hard for us to leave? I think a lot of times we attribute it to time served. But I've been here so long. I've invested so much, but I've given so much. And I just don't want to. I've wasted so many years. I think sometimes we feel so obligated to the time we've spent Mm -hmm. that we realize that you could have spent that time and it may have already served its purpose. It's okay to move on. We, it's hard for us to release ourselves because I think, and I'm not speaking for every woman, but I know I speak for a lot when you just feel like you just need to be attached to somebody. I don't Mm want to be by myself. You know, I've been single for a very long time and I'm super comfortable with me, which makes it difficult to date. My space is good. That means yeah. you got to be gooder <laughs> to get in there. Right, right, right. So I think yeah, it's right. a lot of times it's time. So I've been here so long. I've invested so much. It's got to work. And yeah. that's just not always the case. I, I hear people um, say oftentimes, you know, you know, physical abuse is um, physical abuse is tough. But, you know, emotional, emotional. verbal mm-hmm. abuse could be just as damaging. And um but I, honestly, I don't know if one, because that would imply that one is easier to deal with than Agreed. the other. You understand what I'm saying? So I, I, I don't know if I would necessarily agree with that notion. Let me, let me kind of uh, walk with you down there. Yeah. Because either one of them kind of may have the same root off in a lot of places. So to kind of keep going back in your Rolodex, and this may help other people. A term that we hear now a lot of times in dealing with racism, especially in like the workplace things like that we hear the word or the term microaggressions Mm -hmm. when did you start seeing and because that's something that's hard to pick up on early in the presence but in you know hindsight is always 2020 mm -hmm. yeah so no in your hindsight microaggressions though they expect microaggressions uh, basically is that i mean exactly what it sounds like like, but but, you know very like his control mechanisms were very calculated a lot of mm-hmm, times mm-hmm. A, a lot of times we may look at control as somebody outwardly saying you can't do this you can't do that but if you look at the proposal in church he put her in a place where it's hard for her to refuse the proposal in front of oh, well, the son, yeah. son yeah you know give and her the, the, the yeah. necklace in the bedroom where mm-hmm. it's harder to make noise you know um he 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 made sure that he was always turned the environment mm-hmm. favorable to himself without ever saying a word right, of right. control that's a micro control way of doing things um even plugging in all the time mm-hmm. um and then like you look at the way he was plugging in and playing bit paying bills but yeah. when they got together right. they, were str- rent. they were they were struggling rent. extra hard <laughs> right. you know what I mean? so he kind of like that's a good point he kind of <laughs> like he kind of like tender swings it with you <laughs> right you know saying i don't know if you know you saw that show but oh yeah, my the, God. yeah yeah i saw it and yeah. i was just <laughs> yeah shocked. yeah because I saw so much And it's so of, easy to say, oh, it's such dumb broads and blah, 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 blah. But, but, <laughs> but this is yeah. why. Yeah, we've all been in a situation where people are like, why didn't you? And this is like, yo. Yeah. And especially if it's your first time experiencing something to yeah. that degree. You, I mean, who, you can, you might see a sign, but it's written in Spanish. You don't know what it says until you learn Spanish. Mm-hmm. Right, right. You know what I mean? And so you that's might see the analogy. sign looking it's back. <laughs> you know? That is a good analogy. Hey, I'm going to have to steal that. that, that. Was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely steal that word. <laughs> that is such a 
such a really, really, really good point. Mm -hmm. People don't tell their story for fear of judgment. And I learned this in therapy. We there's shame Mm -hmm. attached to somebody abusing you mental, emotional, whatever it is. There's Mm. shame attached to that Mm. because somebody on the outside looking in says, well, but you a smart girl. Mm. Like, how do you, how does somebody fool you like that? How do you, why didn't you just leave? It's a mistake that people make all the time. It is, it is a very big mistake, but it it keeps people in situations, Mm -hmm. whether it's a physical one or a mental bondage to Mm -hmm. where people get stuck because they don't want to tell their story. Mm -hmm. Right. There's healing in telling the story because there's somebody else that's been there that says, okay, and she's so put together, then, okay, then I, I, I am okay. Because you feel so isolated. Mm-hmm. And you almost feel dumb. Latisse would kill me if she heard me say that. <laughs> but you feel like, okay, how could I have... But who it, who you are at that moment, you just don't... The, the word microaggression, you don't... It doesn't click until much, much later when you start adding... When you start getting all the receipts mm-hmm. and you get and start adding, it's like... Oh, all the way back there, right. Right, right, right? All the way back there, that's this whole. It's just, it's really right. a tough situation because healings come from telling it, but shame somehow gets attached to it by telling it sometimes at the same time. Gotcha. So it gets pretty difficult when you say it out loud. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, even when you when you hear it, when you tell your own story, you hear it yeah. a lot. It's like, oh Jesus, right? Yes. <laughs> oh Lord, was I thinking? <laughs> but you get a little stronger each time. So. You do. You, you get do. a little stronger each you time. You really so. do, and that, that actually is um, because the I've actually finished your relationship book two years ago, but it's been sitting on my computer. I need to not doubt with this story. I have five short stories, five relationship stories. Um, that I've given and I attach a little bit of a comedy to it because some situations can be really intense and while I don't want to trigger anybody I also want to help people understand it's never just you right so I've written five short stories about relationships personal ones I've changed names to protect the not so innocent and they look <laughs> but at the end of each of the stories I've called them gems from the journey I've given three to five things that I learned from that right. you know people say well you're better for it some no some stuff I wish it had never happened. I don't care what lesson I learned. I'd rather have not learned it that way. Yeah. But I made sure at the, each, at the end of each story, I attached how much better I was that it happened, how I learned from it, and how not to repeat it. So mm. it's not just a story about there's this woman that did this, and there's Lanita, and she did those kinds of things. But here's what I learned. And, but some of those situations, I forced myself to learn something because I refuse for the experience to just be a useless one. So even if I had to dig through it, I said, okay, Absolutely. who was I then? Who am I now? Can I attach any of that learning from that situation? Even okay. if it's to never deal with anybody like that person again, mm-hmm. that's my lesson. I like so that. Gems, I, gems of the gems. Gems from the gems. I want to like really jump on that phrase because I, I caught it as soon as, you, as soon as you said it earlier. We said, well, who you are at that moment. And thank you for coming back around to it. So who you are then, who you are now. The reason why that's big for me is the way I kind of look at abuse um even further i I really break down the word abuse right Mm. and as an old spiritual leader of mine used to say when purpose is unknown abuse is inevitable Mm. and the abuse is simply abuse it is the misuse of something sometimes we look at as um we look at it as having to have ill intent or having to have a Mm -hmm. you know an evil intent behind it and sometimes, not sometimes, all the time, abuses in any situation where something or someone is not used for their purpose. So that's good. I wanted you to speak on who you are now and how you're able to recognize because we we we, we when we talk about abuse, we always right. giving folks the signs and what it looks like going forward and how they went through it. But if people could really grasp their purpose now and who they are now and help identify even before in the situation where they see signs that's you know going in because now you're probably saying you're able to say no going in because of who i am and my purpose i know what i need going in mm-hmm. so can you t- kind of t- speak on that on the other side of it of abuse now? sure um one of the biggest things i think i've learned is to be an advocate for myself and to trust my instinct mm. i didn't trust myself Because I didn't know what that looked like. I had seen my mother. I had not seen my mother in a lot of relationships at all. She had them, but she always kept them away from the family. I'm the oldest of seven children. So imagine your mama trying to go on a date and there's seven kids at home. We're trying to figure out what a cereal is. (laughs) So my mother never brought men home. So I don't, the interaction part is something I had to sort of discover on my own 
And while I didn't make a ton of mistakes, I made some severe ones that I wish I had not learned that way. But I didn't really know who I was. All I knew was defense mechanism. So I always had a mouth. I still got a mouth, but I've learned that my victory is in my voice. So I use my voice to advocate for myself. If it doesn't sit well with me, if it feels off for me, something is off. I become so hyper aware of my surroundings that if something is off, I don't question it. I just run with what my instinct is at that time. But I didn't, I didn't trust that at that time. I had no clue what that even meant. I was just like, okay, you're just being mean. Cause I had always been called mean. Why are you so mean? So I always tried to fight against that. Not always, but wanted to fight against that. And then in situations, okay, can be un- don't be mean, don't be mean. But that meant that I was sacrificing me mm. or my instincts by not, because I realized now that was all defense mechanism. That was just to block you from people hurting you, but people still hurt anyway. So you're not avoiding anything. What you're doing is keeping good things from coming in by blocking those things. So you just have to be clearer about what's acceptable and what's not in your space. But who I am now, I'm a voice for, I'm a voice for me. And anybody that's attached to me knows that if some shit goes awry, I'm speaking on it, whether you agree or not. And then I'll deal with the consequences later, but I'm not allowing anything that doesn't look right or feel right in my space, whether it's my personal space or the space of those people that I care about. So I become more of an advocate for myself. That's who I am now. But I'm also really secure in my singleness. Mm. I'm not looking to be attached to anybody. If it happens, I'm open to it. You know, people say, well, you date to marry. I'm not dating to nothing. (laughs) I'm dating because I want to go on a date. I don't have any, I don't have an agenda. I don't have this sort of, um, any motives in that I go because I may want to go on a date or I enjoy somebody's company. If something comes from it, I'm good with it. If it doesn't, I'm good with that too. I've learned to be, to really sort of relax and say, okay, worked out. That's good. If it didn't work out, that's good too. But this need to have a father for my son. Cause I was really, I really, I wanted that for him Yeah. I, because his father was not present. I knew that, you know, some moms say, and no disrespect to anybody, my son don't need, my son needed his father. Yeah. My son needed a father figure, whether right. it was his or not. Mm-hmm. I knew that. And I knew that I could be a lot of things to him, but I could not, I could never be his father. And so I made sure that his father, when he wanted to, could get him that he could. I kept those channels open on purpose. So it would never be said, oh, she didn't. Not true. But I, I know now that I was enough then. And I'm enough now. And that's okay. If I'm attached to somebody, then I'm making them greater and they're making me greater. But trying to look for somebody to complete me. No, I don't. It does. It's not necessary. And it kind of sucks. I'm going to be honest with you, you know, guys like that, because it really messes up the next dude. It does. Because I know there are some men that are persistent because they just like what they like mm-hmm. they know they, they they see it in you they know what they like they know what they're attracted to physically they know that they're attracted to you know so the next dude that's persistent might show a few flashes of the guy that you were you know what i'm saying and, I'm out and, the and, door. and, and, and you got You're this guard right. up now you understand what i'm saying <laughs> that he didn't like what i do that, yeah. right that he didn't <laughs> earn like right. he didn't even earn that label yeah, yeah. but because of what had happened before and persistence mm-hmm. is something that I do like. I am a, an aggressive woman, not mm-hmm. in the in terms of like aggressive, but mm-hmm. I'm a strong woman. So I like a man that can be like, okay, so we going to dinner and can you meet me here? Such and such and such. such. Yeah. And I like that. Yeah. But now I know if it doesn't feel right, if it feels right, I'm okay with it. But it took me a long time yeah. to be okay with a man being persistent with me because initially I was like, Nah, that means yeah. he don't take no. That means he gone. That means, and it was unwarranted for him. And I may have passed up on somebody that was good that came after him because I was just so scarred from this guy because he was so persistent. And I said yes. Right, right, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I want before you got just okay. really quick nugget. Love what you say. Being secure in your singleness. singleness yes. You know, alone, alone doesn't equal lonely at all right so that's that's dope that's like, it that's people perfect. relax on that mm, just to, that to, to, to uh <laughs> spin the block back on the abuse um i read somewhere i found this interesting i want to see if maybe i can get a little clarification from you um that verbal abuse is not only uh speaking aggressively or violently but verbal verbal abuse could also be the unsaid 
verbal verbal abuse could also be what the silence and it's, it's you, you know uh i think they call it withholding or whatever but I, so i wanted to because i didn't quite understand it I, I mean i do and i don't you know as far i, I mean so maybe you can shed light on 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 maybe what that means you know that's actually relatively new okay. i probably heard it where it's new to me it may not be new period but i yeah. heard it probably sometime within the last year or so and i mm-hmm. really like you had to sort of ponder how do you how do you get how, to how that? is verbal abuse verbal silence means yeah speaking. verbal, verbal abuse. means yeah, yeah. so how could non-verbal mm-hmm. also be abusive mm-hmm. but here's what i think it is okay and here's how i think maybe some people get to that um there are situations where I know if I'm and I'm going to use me as an example, no problem. If I'm dealing with a dude and he is bugging like he's inconsistent, which is one of my freaking pet peeves. Don't be inconsistent. I hate that. <laughs> Most women. Yeah. yeah. Right. That part. <laughs> yeah. That part. So I had a flashback. Sorry. I'm back. Now. Nah. I'm back. Consistency <laughs> equals security. Yeah, come back. Yes. Yeah. Which is Jesus women's main need. Me. A woman's main need is security. Please. Mm. Like literally. Or just step away. <laughs> just I'm good. You're okay, blocking but somebody else. But go ahead. Uh-huh. We had a moment. Y'all want us to back. Yeah, y'all want us to give you a second. Secure my singleness. Secure (laughs) my singleness. Frank, we need to cut our mics off for a minute. (laughs) Put the cameras on them. Woo! When I tell you, we went, we went to the same place for just a few (laughs) seconds. Wow, that's amazing. So one of the things I know uh, in a relationship, or if I'm in some sort of some people call a situation show, which I don't necessarily like, but if I'm dealing with a person and I'm I hadn't talked to him in a couple of days and I'm a daily kind of person. If we dealing with each other, I need to hear from you every day to some degree. If I hadn't heard from you at all and on day four, you call me, I'm not answering the phone. Mm-hmm. They're considering that to be a form of abuse because now I'm withholding my communication with you because I'm angry as a way of teaching you when I call you, you or talk, answer. you need to answer the phone. Or in some cases, I've heard another lady say, or somebody else that wasn't late was a guy withholding sex. You know, if you're withholding sex intentionally from me mm-hmm. because you're mad with me, that's a form of abuse. Mm. So that's how I've heard it explained. I do think it's a it's a bit of a stretch. I do I can see the non communication. If I'm if you're my husband yeah. and we're married and you're trying to we're trying to communicate and communication is something that we're working on. It's foundational for a relationship. And I'm trying to converse with you and you don't talk to me at all. For three days, right. that can be considered a form of yeah. abuse. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, it's, and the key word that you used there was relationship, because you know re- each relationship has its own set of unspoken or un- understood rules. You know, a wife hold withholding sex from a husband is different from we talking. Absolutely. And, and it went down on the first date, and now <laughs> and we on date six, and, you, and now look, you're talking to me. <laughs> right. Verbal abuse answering my phone calls. Right. You're abusing me. Right, 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 you're right. abusive. You're, right. Put an you're, you're, you're abusive. Put an R. You're abusive. Put an R. You gotta put an R in there. Right, right, right. So right. you're absolutely right. The definition of what relationship is is pivotal because yeah. if we just right. chilling, then. But and, as my husband, and I know you know, but I had to say that for these listeners because you know these dudes will go, you know, all, all Kevin Samuels. Right, right. <laughs> this you hear what yeah, she's saying? You hear what she said? <laughs> I, I heard this girl she know, said. I know you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know for these listeners, I got to clarify. You ain't yeah. no ass. You ain't give me no ass. Yeah, abuse. Right. She abusing me. So, abuse so me I that, think man. that's what that means. That's how I yeah. how I sort of get it. I do. I think it's kind of a stretch, but yeah. the what the key is: who are we to each other? What have we established hmm. that is part of the success of our relationship, marriage, whatever it is? And then outside of that, yeah. maybe that can be considered abusive. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and I think it's also probably called verbal abuse by a process of elimination. You know, it's not no physical harm is being done to you, but it's certainly emotional or whatever, you know. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. what you're saying. I, um, so on a, on a more serious note, right? So I, I often, whenever I have a, topic sometimes i might get you know uh, a friend that i know that is sort of in a similar situation and i'll i'll, I'll say hey, is there anything that you would like for you know me to ask our guests you know on the podcast uh i didn't get i didn't expect the <laughs> the questions that i i received that to, to give to ask you uh, but um she wanted to know uh, how do you convince a person that doesn't think believe that they're abusive how do you convince them to seek counseling and if that doesn't work then how do you 
plan and exit strategy. You don't and convince them. You don't convince another person of anything. Yeah, you don't convince. Yeah, I just don't think it's possible for me. As much as I love you, or much as we're together, and say you need help, I can express what I think we need. At some point, then I have to take care of myself. Maybe put my own self in counseling, and then sometimes you lead by example. They see, okay, well, she's taking counseling, or he's taking counseling, or they're doing this. Then maybe I do need to work through this. But trying to convince somebody of something is just. I just don't think you can convince anybody to do anything that they don't already want to do. And is that person that asked the question, don't get they married or engaged? Get married. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's really jacked. And yeah. I'm not saying divorce anybody, Lord, but we'll pray, especially because marriage and God, you know, created marriage. Um, but what's even more jacked up about that situation, we have to use the word convince. And this is just, mm. this is just for fellas, uh, married fellas all over. And I'm talking to myself, not on the abuse level, but just general concept. That's the that's the garden trying to give seed to the sower. Okay. The garden doesn't seed the gardener. The gardener sees the the garden. Mm-hmm. So that's a really jacked up situation where you're trying to convince this person to pour a healthy seed into your ground. The woman is the garden in the marriage. You gotcha. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So there's a there are, which reveals that there are much greater issues in addition to the mm-hmm. abuse on the spiritual level. When I say greater, I'm not saying like more dangerous, perhaps. But on a spiritual level, even mm-hmm. so, there's some other things that need to be um, looked at there. Yeah. Um, so I would definitely, um, and that person may find the answers that they need in spirit in, in marriage counseling uh, or in counseling rather solo, mm-hmm. and how to maybe protect mm-hmm. themselves because it's very because trying to give trying to convince the person to do the right thing is it's, pro- it's like something like a double a double dose of abuse. There's a caveat to that as well. The history of what this abuse is with this guy is is very pivotal. Your environment is important. You know, do his friends respond to their mates the way he responds to her? That's a good is point. his father abusive at any point to their mother? Um, to use my case as an example, um, my ex, his mother had been married to his abusive father for 40 years dealing with abuse, emotional and physical, and never left. I would be interested to know what his father's history is. Mm -hmm. So if that's what you've been bred to be, that environment does not promote being anything other than what that thing is. You have to be sometimes removed from all that you know to be something different that you've never been before, and that can be very, very hard. Mm -hmm. If you don't know how to operate outside of abuse, it, abuse can look on un- not being abused can look unhealthy if all you know is abuse. abuse yeah. Dysfunction can be can look very functional if that's all you know. That's a good But point. sometimes it's so that's a great point. so mm-hmm. generational until it's like, well, my mom stayed, my grandmother stayed, so I mean, why right. can't you? Right, right, right. It's right, right, it's right. what it's what they know. Yeah. And I'm not saying that's her case or not. My heart really sort of it's just the way I'm built. Yeah. No, that's because that's when perfect. you when you get to the point of actually asking that question, you've been subjected so much already mm-hmm. until you just need help. You just need help. Yeah. At that point, you have to start helping yourself. Yeah. And just pray that they follow suit or see that something is wrong because there's no convincing mm-hmm. anybody of anything. That's deep. Ooh. That's deep. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's just the cycles of it are just so so interesting I think that's why it was so important to me that I not subject myself to physical abuse like my mother had and like her mother had and like her mother had I just I just refused but my sister ended up being in a marriage that was abusive Mm -hmm. so you can see the little Mm -hmm. sprouts because those seeds have been planted so Mm -hmm. non-intentional but they still germ they still I don't know the word is germiate or germinate but they still grew in this place where you didn't even think it was growing. So to to attach yourself to another person, one of the questions I asked myself was, what was the deficit in me that subconsciously I attached myself to this Mm. person who had all of these demons he was dealing with? What was going on inside Mm. of me? And that's a tough question. But that, Mm -hmm. did you know, but that's, that sometimes it is what's in you. And, 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 not you, but you know, a person. Okay. Sometimes that is either the answer or that's a part of the answer. 
And I always quote Dr. Joyce Irons when I say um, children grow up to be exactly what they see unless they try very hard not to. And you opened up the show saying that, talking about that. It, it has to be extremely intentional to say this. And even, in, and even in your extreme intention, you were like, Still. which is why you asked the question, like, well, who's in me? But you, the answer was in what you said before, seeds. Yeah. You know, the, the seeds were planted and um, you, you know, to kind of put a different spin on it, you can tell the tree by its fruit. And that was the fruit that, and you were a part of the fruit mm -hmm. of a poisonous tree, yep. so to speak. Yep. So that's, so when, so when we go back to talking about gardens and sowing, if you can follow me, <laughs> that was the seed that was apt to grow in you because that was the soil that was created. So going back full circle, when we talk about who you are now, you had a change of soul or a change of soil. Soil. What's Jamie, interesting though Jamie is that dropping it right there. Jamie dropping it over so here. So what's the difference if and I barely this is, kept my wife. Tell me, I barely <laughs> kept my wife. Good job, Crystal. Whatever the people know. who have the seeds who've been exposed to it mm -hmm. and those seeds never grow, and the people who also have the seeds and those seeds do grow. Mm -hmm. I guess that was part of your what you said before. Absolutely. You have to be in I mean aggressively intentional mm -hmm. to not mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You no. know, water that seed. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Say that again. Yeah. Yeah, say, yeah. I mean, you have to be aggressively intentional, mm -hmm. but you also have to be super aware. You know, sometimes we don't want to look back to see what our family history is. Yes, there yeah. are a lot of conversations generation, generationally that we don't discuss. Mm -hmm. Therapy mm -hmm. is one of them. Mm -hmm. Abuse right. is one of them. Mm -hmm. That uncle who come over and I had one that when he came, come we used on. to have to hide our purse in my mama room and lock it up in the cabinet mm -hmm. because he would go in your purse and take your money. I know mm -hmm. that. Those are conversations yeah. that we don't like to have openly, yeah. but the only way that we can move forward sort of as a whole healed kind of person mm -hmm. is that you got to address some of those things. Yes. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, and I didn't honestly think that this would come up, but I don't know how not to address it. Let's go. <sighs> so I was molested uh, at three mm. and I had no knowledge of it until I was in my 20s. Wow. And one day I had a flash of this person on top of me. I went and asked my mother. Oh, my gosh. And I said, Mom, did such and such? And she broke down in tears. And she never denied it. She said, you you were. Oh. You were. I, but I remembered it. But I was such a kid. And I say that to say if I had had that flash and gone to my mother and she had denied it yeah. because you, certain things you don't talk about. She told me who it was. She told me when it happened. And I remember the whole fight situation. She told me the whole thing. Okay. That person, we never got in contact with that person again. They were never allowed to, somebody that was babysitting me, never allowed to keep the kids anymore. But if my mother had done what generationally some of our grandparents and stuff right. do, is this one of those things, you just sort of sweep it up on the rug. Mm -hmm. yeah. That rug is full of things that can heal us if we just lift it up sometime and take those things out one at a time. Because if you uncover everything at once, sometimes we would just... We would be devastated of all the things mm -hmm. that our grandparents and parents have survived. But sometimes we wonder, well, how could I look back? What yeah. did your grandmother, great grandmother, what were their home lives like? What did they deal with? What did they survive? So I want to ask you a really a question that um, may cause you, to, if you haven't already visited this within yourself, because as you stated, you are a very introspective person. One of the ways those two connect because molestation is about control. Mm -hmm. um, and then the abuse you went through, obviously control of any any abuse, control is a major element, and especially in your story. In situations, so that person was able to con bring introduce control as an element to abuse you. The one you told us about in the whole story. Mm -hmm. Um, because they were able to fill a void where you were weak, so to speak, or where you had something missing, right? In other life situations, whether it be professionally, whether it be as a parent, whether it be as a friend, whether it be running your own business, where you were strong and operating without feeling where, where nobody could come in and take over, those seeds are still present. Did you ever, looking back, see where you may have had some controlling elements in situations where someone couldn't take over control over you. Oh, absolutely. Because it sort of reverses. 
in my efforts to not be control, if I'm not careful, I can become the control. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very fine line to walk. And it's one that I have to check myself on very often. But unfortunately, unfortunately, I mean, it is what it is. I find myself sometimes completely retreating mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll isolate. And my therapist really has to say, when the last time you had a conversation with a person? Because I'm, I'm so cool just being with myself. But it becomes, it can, it's a very fine line with trying not to be controlled by a situation or a job or a person or a friendship or any kind of relationship. You can become now controlling in order to not be controlled. So it's a stronghold you really have to be aware of on a regular basis. And I had a situation today, a work situation, that I really had to say, I have to log off and I have to take 30 minutes because this is going to be bad. Mm -hmm. But I'm so aware of it. When I feel a certain way, I said, okay, you can't. We're not doing this. We're yeah. not doing this. And I really do have to unplug. And I'll take a walk or I'll take a drive. And I come back and I'm good. Because now I have had to regain my composure mm -hmm. in order to keep it all together. So it's a, it's a very, very fine line to walk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's a really, really good question. Oh, wow. Mm -mm. This was a lot. It was a lot. It was a lot. Yeah. We thank you so much for being time. so transparent. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Before we get up out of here, is there anything that you want to share? Somebody may be watching, going through something right now where they're wondering, like, uh, am I suffering? Am I dealing with it right now? I see some kind of signs, but I don't know. Anything you can share. I'm out of the abuser. Yeah, that part too, because, you know, it happens. Yeah. When you are abused, sometimes you become an abuser. So, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's um, that hurt people, hurt people. Mm -hmm. I think probably one of my biggest things that I advocate for, that I speak on, that I'm passionate about, is for people never to feel like it's just them. You are not alone. And it's not, it's never a situation that you're in that you cannot get through. Right. It's just going to take. It's going to be hard. Anybody that's telling you, oh, just is just take the word just out. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy at all. But I can guarantee you it's going to be worth it. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to look in the mirror and say, I'm OK. And it has taken me years to get to that point. I like a mirror when I'm all dressed up. <laughs> but when you look at that mirror mm -hmm. raw and say, but you good, that's tough. Because when you just stop and take a few moments to look in the mirror and really just look at yourself, you see all of the stuff you took, all of the stuff you've been through, all the stuff you survived. And it's like, girl, you look a wreck. But then I'm like, but you survived it, so you good. But I, it's, I think it's important for people to understand that they're not alone. Yeah. And you are worthy of being in any situation where you are valued. If that's not what you're in, you have to reevaluate everything. Whatever that avenue is for you, counseling, uh, your church, or, you know, we tend to think, just just pray to God, it'll be okay. That is absolutely the direction that you need to take. It is not, however, the only avenue you need to take. You have to be an active and willing participant in your change and in your healing. You got to participate in it. It's not going to knock on your door and say, nobody, nobody is coming to save you. You got to save yourself, but you got to also do some of the work. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard, but it's going to be worth it. Do you recommend therapy? Oh, because <laughs> I'm an advocate for therapy. I'm just saying. I, I, I absolutely. Am, yes. Absolutely. Therapy is imperative. There is nothing like being in a safe space right. where you can tell, you can unearth all the bodies. You can tell all the dirt. And yeah. somebody can make that into this, 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 this situation or this space where you feel like, okay, I'm okay, and I can get through this yes. one step at a time. Yeah. There's yeah. homework, there's yeah. facing yourself. And it's not, if you have a really good therapist, they're not always going to be nice to you. Mm. Right. They're going to make you face yourself. And sometimes that is very difficult to do because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I know I present well. I right. show up good. Right. And my grandma can say, you show up good. Right. You clean up good. Mm -hmm. But when you take all that off and get down mm -hmm. to it, who are you after all of that? Mm -hmm. Are you okay in that space? And therapy makes you face that but it's so necessary and it's so healing. Our parents and grandparents, is, it's not something. My mother knows I go to therapy. She doesn't ever ask me about it, but I make sure I always, I always let her know I had a good therapy session today. And she just sort of, says, okay, that's good. It's just not something they ever talked about. Yeah. She's not against it. She's not an advocate for it. She just, as long as you happy, I'm good. That's how she sees it. 
So it, I'm an advocate for it 100%. And it, it takes a while. People think therapy, oh, I'm just going to find me a therapist, call my insurance. And I've gone through three therapists before I got to a therapist. I felt like that I could relate to, that understood who I was, but that was strong enough to say, your shit is raggedy. Mm-hmm. But let's fix it. Yeah. Let's let's start it. Let's fix it. But you gotta you gotta tell me the truth. But right. you gotta tell you the truth first. Are you really okay? And let's unpack that. So recommendations on finding a good therapist. If I've never been to therapy, I don't know anything about it. I don't know who to reach out to. How do I find one? So for me, my initial ones, I went through my insurance. Mm-hmm. That proved not to be a good avenue for me. Although I, I have heard some very good stories about it. But for me, my insurance was very blanket. Yeah. Here are therapists in your area. What's your zip code? Here are the ones. Here's how much we cover. The therapist I have now was actually recommended by another therapist that was recommended by somebody else who wasn't taking clients. So the referral for me was start asking people. Or yeah. it's not something you want to say, hey, girl, you cute. You got a therapist? You know, it's <laughs> not that. But in, in, in a situation where you trust, yeah. the word of mouth for me proved to, to work very well. And I'm very grateful because I, I feel like I'm... It's somebody that understands me as a person, the whole person, Mm -hmm. and knows enough to say, this ain't right. Let's fix this. Yeah. So referrals work for me. My insurance gave me the couple years that I did go through insurance that they had referrals and it covered quite a bit, but that didn't, that didn't work for me. Okay. Oh, thank you for all that. Tiff, you got a question? Um, I don't have a question. I just wanted to piggyback off of what Lenita said. Um, what you can do also, is, you, is as she mentioned, contacting your insurance company. And the specific department you want to speak with is the EAP. Employee, oh, that's good. Employee Assistance Program. And when you call them, you just call your insurance. You tell them that you want to be connected to the EAP de- department. And they will then ask you specifically what you're looking for. They will ask you some triggering questions just to make sure they're pointing you in the right direction. And then they will then go forth with what Lenita just mentioned, asking for your zip code, asking if you want to speak, if you would like to see a male or female, if you prefer for it to be African-American or another or another race. And so those are the things that they'll ask. So it's not, you know, like you have to speak to someone at your job specifically and get them in your business. You know, right. you can set it up and typically they give you, depending on your insurance, you typically get like three to five free sessions. And typically in those mm, sessions, you can go to one, as we need to just mention, go to one therapist in your area. Hey, if it works, then you can use your other two freebies on that person. If you go to that person and you're like, yeah, wasn't really feeling him you don't have to feel obligated to go back to that person they're not offended because they got a hundred other people lining up to come see them and then you can use your freebies to see someone else until you find that person that you really feel like you connected with hopefully you can find it within that period of time but then as she mentioned also referrals obviously are always you know always great that's such yes, good information. Good point, good yeah, point, she too. literally stole that. That's exactly what I was going <laughs> to say, but she, she explained it much better. And Tiff, I believe you can use EAP for marriage counseling, correct? You definitely can. You yeah. can use EAP. Oh, that's awesome. EAP can be used for any type of counseling, specifically mm-hmm. um, marriage counseling, um, um, substance abuse, um, mm-hmm. anything that you can think of that would contribute to you being a whole person. You can utilize your EAP for it. Obviously, you can also contact them. If you wanted some information about your... Um, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, investments. Or if you want to, you know, look into taking some type of physical classes, like going to the gym or, you know, they have different branches of your EAP. It's about, it's about okay. wellness. So when you contact them, they'll be able to point you in the right direction just based on what your needs are. A lot of people don't know they have that option with the no. insurance. We just think about insurance for medical purposes, like mm-hmm. when we go to the doctor and such. But there is a wellness component of every healthcare institute so you know make sure that you're taking advantage of that as well do you work in insurance i work in healthcare healthcare. (laughs) very good (laughs) and i have for for a very long time that's really good information it's it's good to know absolutely thank you thank you and go ahead sorry before we get up out of here we wanted to uh, see if you wanted uh, information about your journals people can purchase them how can they find on social media with your big presence (laughs) on social media not small okay (laughs) So the two journals I have currently um, are available on Amazon um, under my name, Lenita Brinson. You have the power is one. And the second one is um, what do I do now? How do, now the, how do I survive? I can't even remember the name of them, unfortunately. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I survived. You survived. Now what? Woo, that was yeah, tough. Yeah. And they're prompted journals. Um, I found that writing for me has been extremely therapeutic. I have about 10 journals. They're all over my house. When something hits me, I start writing. So that's why I started with the journals. This next book, my promise to myself is that I have it out by the end of the year. I'm super nervous about folks in my business, but I literally just laid it all out right here. Yes. So the gate is now open. So sure. now I'm charged yeah. to getting it done. But on social media, uh, my name is Cami C-A-M-I underscore speaking on Instagram. I do not have a Facebook presence. I've always been sort of scared of Facebook, but Instagram can join me. I would love to have you. And spell your first and last name for Amazon searchers. Lanita, L-A-N-I-T-A. Last name Brinson, B R I N S O N. Great. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much, Miss Lynn. Oh, this was so good. It was a pleasure having you. I was a nerd. This right. was awesome. Girl, I don't know why you did great. Wow. <laughs> it was so, so much information. Right. Yeah. Yep. So, for everyone who enjoyed listening to us on your chosen podcast outlet, if you want to see the visual version of this, feel free to log on and subscribe to us youtube.com forward slash the truth no chaser yes yes and for more awesome content and our unbelievable merch you can also visit us at the truth no chaser.com and until next time keep walking your truth black people yes sir.